and we live welcome back guys to the hassle of hair episode 81 i think and it is christian the hungarian nightmare wellish before we get started i wanted to sing you a song i'm just a teenage dirtbag baby this is for my daughter eva she's been singing it all fucking day and i'm tired of it i'm just a teenage i'm just kidding I, I shouldn't have said the F word. I'm sorry. I forget that I do this in my house and she could hear. I love you, Eva. <laughs> but, um, yeah, welcome back, guys. This is uh, The Hassle of Hair, episode 81. Christian, the Hungarian Nightmare. This is not my wife. Nope. This is Nashi. I'm uh, gay. <laughs> 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 at Nasia. At, 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 at Nasia. No. Rem- no. How do no. I say your- I fuck up your name every time. Just say Nashi. Nashi. Okay. Nashi. There's a reason why I don't yeah. use my name. Nashi Ramirez. Yep. So go ahead and introduce yourself, Nashi. Hey, I'm Nashi Ramirez. I'm a tattoo artist and a fight artist, strike fitness. I've been on here a couple times. And so, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Nashi has been on three times. This is her fourth time. Yep. And we have some big news. Yeah. You want me to say it? Uh, I guess, uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, go ahead, Nosh. You okay, say it. Cool. I have a podcast coming up for you guys and shit. It's going to be <laughs> real fucking cool and talk about mental health, art, tattooing, all that fucking cool ass shit. It's called Happy Dagger. So keep an eye out for it. Really excited. So yeah. Happy Dagger podcast. It's, uh, in your Instagram link, right? Yeah. It's in my Instagram link and my Instagram is nasty dot Nashi. So what are we going to be? Actually, I'm producing it and she's the, she's the host, the guest, the star, and she's the her, it's her show. Yep. So what what are we gonna be talking about it? Uh, talking about on your show, Nashi? Uh, primarily mental health things like you know how to cope with things like schizoaffective disorder, and primarily trying to like bring light into the whole like scene, how to take care of it, and involving tattooing, day to day life, and fighting and all this shit. So it's just kind of be like a b- big chaotic mess, and it's gonna be great. So and aliens, we have a lot of alien shit coming. Hell yeah. Yeah. Yeah, alien shit. Yep. Um, yeah, we, we're yeah. I I think we're gonna have fun with it. Yeah. And it's sad to say, but I'm gonna say your your podcast is probably gonna be better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> As people are listening, they're like, oh, fuck. they're like, you know what? Sure, okay. <laughs> I'm like, oh, fuck no. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but our podcast, my podcast, this is not my wife. Nope. This is Nashi. She's yep. gay. Yep. Um, but our podcast is sponsored by Adaptive Sessions. Mr. Diego is a kettlebell expert. Oh, let's not say expert, right? He's certified in kettlebells. He'll work you out with kettlebells and he will hold mitts with, for you. He was a former amateur, uh, fighter in Muay Thai, but he's also just an overall martial artist. Martial artist, it, the difference between martial artist and fighter is a big deal. Martial artists never stop training. They're never, they never stop being students. They're always trying to find new ways to be better. And, uh, he's, he's a purple belt in jujitsu. He's a Muay Thai amateur fighter who's been training for years and he's, he's always learning stuff. That's why he call he calls it adaptive sessions, right? He's just an adaptive kind of guy. So Nashi, what's one thing you've adapted in, in your life? Um, mental health. <laughs> I didn't always have fucking schizoaffective shit and fucking need to learn how to adapt to that. You need to be able to fucking go with it when, you know, you do experience a new symptom, you know, a new hallucination. Hey. Yep. Yeah. Then we'll be talking about that on the Hap- Happy Dagger podcast and nasty.nashi na- on, in her Instagram page, right? This is yep. my first time introducing a podcast, guys. Give me a fucking break. <laughs> <laughs> There'd be a bunch of clunking comments and everything like that. Bro, I have some notes for you. It's like, okay, <laughs> great. Fantastic. You can take those nice notes for next time. So Yeah. But uh but yes, today, let me give you guys a little rundown on Christian Wellish. Christian Wellish Wellish, the Hungarian nightmare, is a former UFC fighter from back in the day before the before the um UFC hundred, right? He was uh gonna be on the Ultimate Fighter 2. But ended up um, going to law school. Yeah, he, he became a lawyer. That's cool. So he fought in the UFC while going to, uh, to law school and uh, be- becoming a lawyer. He's also um, 
Imagine fucking going to the courtroom and seeing a fucking your lawyer is a fucking a fighter and shit like that. It's all jacked. <laughs> well, you know? He goes into it saying that uh that he walked into to to the being a lawyer and he walked in with a black eye and then he also talks about how he um how he he being bigger, he's six foot, like he's six foot two, six foot three, like two two thirty, two like two like heavy, right? He's a heavyweight. <laughs> And just it for being a lawyer, it's kind of intimidating. It, yeah, it's I was too intimidating, say, right? It sounds fucking terrifying. So let let me give a rundown on who he, uh, I mean, his record in, in UFC and which ones he's he's fought in, and because um, obviously I'm always unprepared and I don't have it up. I can't wait till we have a TV no. and we could just have it right there. But Nashi, I'll show you him. Yeah, big guy, right? Yeah. Yeah. He's fucking that. He's fucking like what six foot two? Oh shit! Yeah, two hundred uh, two hundred thirty four pounds. He trained at in San Jose in the AKA days, the cool. the the early days of AKA before Cain Velasquez, and before I get started, he uh he did um reach out to me again and tell me that the comments he made about Cain Velasquez, he uh he really wants to make sure, and I don't think it even sounds bad, but he really wants to make sure to tell people that Cain was great. And he used to get beat up by Kane all the time, or, or he wasn't better than Kane, right? And and um, that Kane was just a great fighter, right? He didn't want to come off as arrogant or sounding like he was talking crap, but he uh, he really respected Kane. And but you'll listen. I don't think it sounds like that at all. Um, but he he was eight and five. He fought mm, one, two, three, four, five times in the UFC, and after his last loss, he decided that he didn't want to fight anymore because he always wanted to be at the top. He didn't want to start going backwards. And he had he had the opportunity of being a lawyer. So, I mean, not many fighters can do that. So he's just a really, really smart guy. I had a conversation. Like, I was supposed to tell his story, but it's just he's such an interesting dude that I just kept on talking to him, right? And, um, yeah, I, I really loved the interview. Uh, he's a, a really great guy. I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, but yes, check out Nashi's uh, podcast, the Happy Dagger podcast on on Anchor on YouTube. I'm gonna be uploading it right after this. So, uh, so how? Uh, let's talk about training. You have, actually have a, a fight coming up, right, Nashi? She, yeah. Nashi's a fighter, by the way. Yeah. When's your fight? Um, I think we have a PKB in March, and then I'm going to be an- going to do an amateur fight in May. And that's going to be really fucking exciting. I'm excited for it. So. And you're pretty stoked, right? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. I hope I can use elbows. I really do. It'd be really fun. You're like the... I I hardly tell you this, but you're like the hardest... I've never seen anybody work as hard as you. <laughs> <laughs> Feels like bullshit, but sure. But you do, though. Like you think uh, It's hard to step back because my, ta- my, my wife... My wife always t- like tells me, like, relax like be confident in yourself you're you're doing good because i always question myself if i'm mm-hmm. working hard enough yeah but like i think like if you take a step back and just look at your life nosh like you went from from being dealt with this schiz- schizophrenia schizoaffective. Uh, schiz- schizoaffective yeah. disorder i better get that right if i'm going to produce They're different shows. yeah and um mania right mm-hmm. dealing with all these mental health issues and you would think that like I was just talking to my buddy Juan today yeah. and he said that, man, b- before he listened to your first episode, mm-hmm. he thought that people would, it was it. If they had what you had, it, it was done, right? Mm-hmm. They couldn't, they couldn't function. Yeah. Dude, you, you, uh, I mean, dude, that you're, um, <laughs> dude is fine. <laughs> but you're, you're tattooing. Yeah. You're almost a, a full-time artist, right? A, a, a tattoo, professional tattoo artist. Yeah. You're a half artist right now, right? Yeah. I don't know what that means. Like I, you're one person, so I don't know how you're half. But um, it's like what it's like what I'm able to catch on a walk-in and everything. Primarily things like you know big color bombs. I mean, I'm not able to catch at the moment, or things like portraits. I can't catch at the moment, but fucking I could do you a name on the hand or some shit like that. Got it. So hell yeah. Yeah, but you're 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 half artist. You're gonna make your amateur debut. Hell yeah. Like look at that regular. I'm not saying you're not regular, but people that don't deal with mental health. Mm-hmm. Some people don't even fucking do half of what, we, what you've done. That that's weird to think. I feel so tired. 
But it's like, it, I don't know. See, I always fucking get that, you know, like, oh, you know, that you're, you know, doing really good and you're putting in a lot of work and everything. You're really brave for doing what you're doing and everything like that with mental health and everything. But it's like, what the fuck am I, else am I supposed to do? The fuck else am I supposed to do? Just fucking sit here and let shit happen to me? Well, fuck that. You know, so... I just want I want people to know that's not the end of the line when you get diagnosed as like you know schizoaffective or any some kind of other psychotic disorder because people they do get led to think that a lot that you know it's over you know that you're fucked and so it's like it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. Yeah. And I all I, like I'm having fun with the podcast. We only did one episode, but I was thinking about it today, mm-hmm. and I really want to promote the the artist mind. Hell yeah, definitely. Because cool. it's so different, and I love seeing you. I love seeing you talk about weird shit in front of people that don't yeah. know you. And I love seeing the reactions. It's like tasting h- sounds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That shit's weird because it's not even like a taste taste. It's like a, a nose taste, you yeah. know? So. But uh, thank you for being a co-host today. Yeah, no problem. It's all thank, good. Thank you for introducing uh, Christian, the Hungarian nightmare. Wellish, former UFC fighter, lawyer, and overall great guy. Um, anybody that comes on this podcast and deals with me, thank you. Um, <laughs> but this one, I actually think I did a really good job at interviewing and, uh, I hope you guys enjoy it. And man, I am just so excited for the future. Are you excited for the future, Nash? Hell yeah. You fucking sick. Hell yeah. Thanks. Shout out to Kiko coffee crew. Love you guys. Thank you for sending me a beanie. It's coming in soon. I'll wear it on the podcast. Um, shout out to our gym, Strike Fitness. What? Oh, I thought you were going to like shout them out too. You're like, Woo! yeah. Woo! <laughs> yeah, our gym, our coach, Amber Pope. Way to go. Oh, yeah. Um, We wouldn't be here without you. We love you, coach. We lo- I don't, I don't say I love you, coach. I, lo- I, I love you, coach. Yay! <laughs> I love her. She's emotion, great. emotion. Emotion is hard, but it's necessary. <laughs> you don't want to be a fucking robot. <laughs> So. I, I, it's funny because I could tell, ev- I could say like, I love you guys. Mm-hmm. But if I say I love you to one particular person, mm-hmm. it's weird, right? It's different. It means, it's it different, means different. Right? Yeah. Jesus. It feels different. That's weird. So that's but, okay though. Yeah. Shout out to, to Coffee Crew. Um, shout out to, uh, um, I don't know. What else. Let's just end this thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I don't know what else right. to say. I'm just a teenage dirtbag, baby. Mm. I'm just... A- <laughs> That's funny because you're like, what, 30? <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Enjoy the episode. I love you guys. Check out our sponsor, Adaptive Sessions. Check us out. Subscribe, like, rate us too. Give us reviews on Apple Podcast. Um, Yes, add us on Instagram, the hassle of hair. Add Nashi, nasty.nashi on Instagram, guys. And here is Christian, the Hungarian Nightmare Wellish. My career was, it started when in America, it was basically relatively unknown. And by the time I hung up the gloves, it was already mainstream. So it spanned that period, you know? Yeah. And you, you were on Ultimate Fighter 2, right? Uh, I was. Or you tried out, you. tried out. Yeah. yeah. So that's when I was in law school and I would have, uh, the UFC had their own requirements because they would uh, like kind of uh, keep you locked down for a certain amount of time in Vegas before and during the filming and whatnot. And then I had my law school finals and I couldn't, none of them would budge where it would work out. So I couldn't postpone my finals in law school and I couldn't get out of the lockdown for the UFC. So I, I, I couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and that, it, it that's not better for me, by the way. <laughs> and because, that's a good uh, oh sorry no I, I what i mean is i it worked out better for me contractually because i still got in the ufc and i wasn't locked into the um to the contract uh so i was able to make more money yeah and I, i'm pretty sure my wife doesn't know that when you do the ultimate fighter the the contracts are not as uh luxurious as the it's kind of like the rookie contracts in the nfl right they they have you for a long time but making minimal money and uh even though yeah, you probably, even though you get better, right? Yeah, exactly. It's kind of a trade-off because um, being on the TV show, especially earlier in, uh, you know, the first the first uh, 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 season of the Ultimate Fighter, I had a, a lot of a lot of my teammates and friends were on there. Mike Swick is like one of my best friends. We trained together from way back in the day, 
uh, at AKA. And then Bobby Southworth was on there and Josh Koscheck, who later left AKA, but we were all on the same team. I was, I went off to law school and they went off to do the um, ultimate fighter. Um, but so they, that's when it got exposed to the masses and everybody kind of saw the sport uh, and what it could become in America because before that, not too many people, the ca there were no casual fans. It was only those people who would seek it out and watch it on like pay-per-view from Japan or like videotapes or whatever. Uh, and with that mass exposure, those, those guys became household names. So they were able to uh, monetize that for, you know, endorsements and whatnot, but they were also locked into these contracts um, that, uh, if somebody comes into the UFC without being locked into those contracts, you could make a lot more money uh, because you're not tied into those long-term renewable contracts where your your fight pay is relatively low. Now, Mike and everybody, and those guys who who made it beyond that, uh, you know, they made plenty of money. Uh, maybe not as much as they should have, uh, given that the UFC makes probably most of the money. I mean, they're, they're, they're in, they're, they're a, a business enterprise. They're in, they've done a lot for the sport. I, I don't want to take that away from them because they uh, essentially, however they did it, they got, they're the ones who made the unified rules uh, apply everywhere before that. I, I fought in places where they, they didn't have judges and they didn't, uh, they didn't know what to do when, the, when the time ran out. Like, well, how do we call the winner? <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of like when, when fighting didn't really, when MMA didn't really have a, a really, uh, a basic standard, right? They didn't have a standard for how it should be. Exactly. Uh, and it was, um, you know, you'd go to different places and fight under different rules. Um, so the UFC did a lot to kind of uh, standardize the format and make it accepted uh, in different jurisdictions worldwide. But of course, they're a business they're in is primarily to make money for themselves. Uh, so on the one hand, the fighters make more money now than uh, before, uh, at the same time, uh, you know, the UFC pays as much as they need to, not as much as the fighters generate because they generate all that money and most of it goes to the UFC. So even if there are millionaires in the sport now, uh, as far as the fighters go, most of them probably don't make as much as, you know, they generate because they don't have that, uh, ability to, uh, uh, kind of bargain uh, as other sports do through their unions and whatnot. Yeah. And I, I haven't really, I only tell the people around me that don't really know fighting and I'm an amateur, right? I've only been in the world of fighting for a little bit, but in my head, the way I, what I've seen so far is that, that promotions and they do do a lot for the sport, but at the same time, they hold this gold over you, which is the, the, the belts, the, the championships, they hold it over you and tell you, go you have to go after this and you'll make a lot of money if you get there but you have to be poor and and break your back doing it while you you get up to, to there right and it just it doesn't make any sense to me yeah and um um i, I you know my story is kind of unique but my, my my kind of backup plan i guess or i don't know which was the backup plan fighting or law school but you know <laughs> yeah. i had something else to do besides uh uh dedicate my life to fighting, uh, which it takes an incredible amount of work, but at the same time, it's, you know, you're lucky if your career lasts, you know, 10 years or whatever, because I, I fought for about 10 years, but I'm lucky that I didn't have any career ending injuries or whatever. And I didn't necessarily fight as often as I, as other guys who rely on that as a paycheck do, which also increases your odds of injuries and whatnot. So if you do get a long enough career, you need to make millions because you need something to retire on, yeah. you know, and most guys are not going to make millions. Most they'll have to find some other way to make a living when they're, when they're done with fighting or they, or they keep fighting well beyond the point where they should quit. And I, I do want to get into your story, but I do have a question after you saying that I do have a question. Do you think it, do you think the reason why they have short careers and they don't have anything after that, do you think, that falls on the promotion or do you think that falls on the fighter because there's a lot of stuff you can do while fighting to to make money right uh yes Nowadays. at the same time there's a lot of stuff you can do at the same time the sport the, the fans to be honest with you in the sport the fans are what i would say very fickle like if you're on top if you're in the spotlight 
uh, you're only as good as your last fight. Yeah. Uh, you can be written off uh, after having a bad fight. You know, and it's few, a few guys who can carry their name and carry their marketability with them, like, you know, Conor McGregor or whatever. A few guys who are like um, uh, marketable even beyond their ability um, because, because of whatever they do. And, they, and they're able to parlay that into various business ventures or whatever. But I mean, you can't have everybody doing that. Not everybody's going to make money that way. Um, and you can do other things within the sport or ancillary things like teaching or gyms or whatever. You can do that to make money. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a very, um, uh, as all, even, even um, amateur wrestling or any sport that's like an individual sport where you're either the best or you're not. It's a, it's a, it's a, the rate of attrition, I guess, or whatever you want to call it is, you know, there's only one champion. There's only one best. So why is somebody going to give you a lot of money if you're not, if you're not that guy, <laughs> yeah. right? You can make, a, you can make good money in the sport, but, um, you know, there's no guarantees, I guess, is what I'm saying. Yeah. It's, I guess it, Dana White said it right. I seen the interview where he said that it's an opportunity, not a career. Yeah, I, I guess, I guess, yeah. I guess that's that's probably a good way of 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 saying it. And I, and you know, nowadays there are guys who are uh, making millions, but again, they need to because if they're going to retire, I mean, anybody to retire at a certain point, you need a couple of million dollars like saved up somehow, <laughs> right? Yeah. Especially with the Not cost of living in California these days, right? It's crazy yeah. over there. Um, Not everybody ends up being a lawyer, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> And, you know, that's that's a, that's a whole other um, it's funny, but there's those misconceptions about lawyers just as just as there is about fighters. I mean, not every lawyer is a millionaire. Right. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's hard to you know, that's also a competitive business, but it's something that you can um, do into your 50s, 60s, 70s, whatever. And you make more money with more experience, whereas fighting um, you make less money as you get. Beat up yeah, and you're not supposed to. I mean, I, you know, I could have kept on fighting, but I didn't want to. Um, I just actually said that I didn't want to take any steps back. So uh, I think I got up to a point where I was, um, um, uh, I was at a level and a kind of at a maybe a plateau or whatever you want to call it, where, uh, you know, I could have been fighting in the UFC for a while, maybe, or at that level but I didn't want to go backwards. And then, so the UFC kind of cut my contract. I could have got back, back there and could have fought again, but I didn't want to take any steps backwards. So I said, okay, I'm done. Plus I had some other things going on. A lot of guys are not willing to, or not able to do that because fighting is their life. That's how they make a living. Uh, they maybe they've made it a little money in fighting. They've never seen that money all at once. Uh, uh, they've never seen that much money all at once before. And they think it's a lot of money. They don't think of the long term, like, okay, Maybe you made fifty, hundred thousand dollars, or whatever. Uh, yeah, that's a lot of money as a lump sum. But what are you going to do with that? Like I said, in California, what is the average home like six hundred thousand dollars or something? Yeah, it's, it's like <laughs> yeah. four hundred, four fifty. Yeah, yeah. So it's crazy over here. Yeah, it's nuts. Uh, and, and Hawaii is the same. So, and <laughs> that's where I, I guess, I want to tell people that you're a very rare person when it comes to fighting you, you like you said you're either a lot of people are all in and it's all they do you your story is that you came from Hungary, right at a, at a young age and you became an american and you uh basically went to law school as you were fighting professionally yeah yeah it was it's was, it was, thinking back on it i don't even know how i did that that's crazy yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question though. Was fighting always in the cards for that, or was were you just planning on like, oh, let me just you know go to the gym and practice this, and then someone's like, hey, do you want to fight? Well, kind of. So I'll I'll, I'll I'll get to that. So let me let me let me go way back. So um, when my family and I, when we left Hungary, I was um, about twelve or something like that, and um, Hungary was still a, a communist country. It was still the Eastern Bloc. And uh, I guess my parents must have known that something was about to happen, uh, but nobody could tell that it was going to be peaceful because it turned out to be a peaceful revolution over there when when the Iron Curtain fell and everything. But nobody could predict that ahead of time. The 
Last time they tried any kind of change back in like 1956, the Russian tanks rolled in and a bunch of people died. So um, my parents decided to leave, but we had to wait for about two years in Austria before we could get to the United States. Um, and then finally we arrived. I basically started high school in the United States and got into uh, uh, wrestling. They wanted to, they were trying to figure out where to put me in sort of what, what class and what sports and whatnot. And I was, I was tall and skinny for my, uh, for my uh, age. And so they wanted to put me in basketball and I, I've never liked basketball. <laughs> and so, <laughs> but you didn't speak uh, English at the time when you came over, right? Yeah, no, we, we learned a little bit in Austria, but I mean, learning English as a second language in a country that doesn't speak English <laughs> uh, on a daily basis, it's not, you can't understand anything. You may know a few words here and there and try to, anyway, so we had to real quick catch up and learn English. So of course, that's a lot easier when you're uh, younger. So, um, you know, being immersed in the environment, I kind of learned um, uh, as anybody would, you have to, it's a necessity, you just pick it up uh, relatively easily. Plus. In Europe, I already had to learn Russian in school. Uh, we spoke Hungarian. I had to learn German. So Jesus. when you learn a bunch of different languages, it's easier to, you, your brain kind of adapts and it's easier to pick up new languages. And relatively speaking, English, in my opinion, is easier to learn than like German or Russian or probably Hungarian. It's probably very difficult for non-native speakers to learn. But anyway, I got into wrestling because I hated basketball and I didn't like wrestling when I started it until I kind of uh, was a natural at it. And basically the only reason why I went to college was to continue my amateur wrestling career. And then I, my amateur wrestling career kind of stopped because I dislocated my shoulder and then I couldn't just sit on my butt. Uh, I had to do something physical so i went down to sign up for jiu-jitsu at the american kickboxing academy and they kind of saw that i had a talent for it and they're the ones who talked me into fighting um uh back in like 2000 or whenever it was when i first started. and that's when it was marcel marcelo garcia right was that marcelo garcia in ak the jiu-jitsu coach no um uh we eventually had uh um What's his name? Oh God, why am I drawing blanks now? Um, no, he was never there, but um, most of the uh, 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 jujitsu coaching I got from, uh, uh, what's his name? He split off from AK, but why am I drawing a blank? Uh, I I think I, for some reason I written, wrote down Marcelo Garcia, but I don't think it was Marcelo Garcia. No. <laughs> he was an AK. Yeah, he was an AK. <clears throat> No, uh, it was, uh, anyway, it'll come to me, but uh, yeah. this is ridiculous. Maybe I did get too many headshots. I don't know. I can't remember the name. Um, but anyway, um, that's how I got into fighting. Plus, I used to, to be honest, I was, a, I was a big pro wrestling fan growing up. And to me, um, I always wondered if it could be... Uh, made into a real sport what if it were real you know yeah. and that was the attitude in my view uh mma evolved from two different uh ends on a spectrum on the one end there was like the brazilian style of anything goes valley to those fights that they've had for however many years and on the other hand you had the japan japanese uh approach where they tried to take pro wrestling and make it real like with pancreas and all this other um uh, all these other organizations. And I think those two kind of merged. And that's how I view MMA as a sport evolving. Um, and back in those days, uh, the big money fights uh, were in Japan. And that's when it was just, uh, they were just working out the rules and everything. And, and, and I, um, uh, I, was, I was very much attracted to that. I was, uh, I thought it was really neat how in Japan they packed like 100,000 people into the stadium for one of these uh, early Pride uh, shows, yeah. um, and and they had a um, a reverence for the sport back then that um, did not exist in the United States at that time. And so anyway, that's I, I was drawn into that. And at AKA when I first started training there, we had um, Brian Johnson was one of the um, guys who 
trained there. And what he would do is he would do his fights. He fought in the early UFCs and then he would, um, he would also do pro wrestling. So he'd go to Japan for like two weeks, do some pro wrestling, make a bunch of money that way, and then come back and train. And he was on his way to get back into fighting. And he was training uh, the Japanese pro wrestlers for real fights. So they would come to AKA and train, uh, prepare for their fights. When they would pr uh, fight in pride? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, he because that, that was that was insane that that Pride had a bunch of pro wrestlers that didn't even know how to. Some of them didn't know how to fight. Right, uh, and the Japanese style of pro wrestling though is a lot more realistic than what uh, the American style of pro wrestling, at least it was back then. And so, well, you know, one of the biggest stars of MMA, one of the pioneers of MMA, was Kazushi Sakuraba, who was a pro wrestler, and he he beat what he beat four Gracies. Uh, they called he's him a, the Gracie, the Gracie killer. Yeah. The Gracie. Yeah. Hunter. Yeah. Um, and he was the, one of the, one of the innovators of the sport and he was one of the legends of the sport. Um, and you know, he's, he's, he was an amateur wrestler and he was a pro wrestler. And so, um, uh, a lot of the, a lot of that back then, it was also about, you know, getting, uh, uh, respect for your style of fighting and all that. And, and that's what those, uh, fights were about with, uh, with him and the Gracies and all that. And then they, uh, of course, in Japan, they have a different, different notions about what the fight is about. Like oftentimes they don't really care about winning or losing as much as that fighting spirit or Bushido or whatever they call it. So they would throw in guys against opponents that were like a hundred pounds heavier and all this. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was kind of crazy, but, um, uh, and and, and uh, the AKA when you were in the beginning when you first started off and going to AKA, the the sparring room's iconic now. You see it all over YouTube. You see it. You see hmm. it all over the videos. You were there with when it like before Kane. You were there before DC. Before yeah. the it just main Luke Rockhold like when they just went on a run with three uh, uh, belt holders and yeah what. Were you, when you guys were there, did you guys know that this would turn into something big? Did you know that there was going to be money when you were walking into those gyms? Were you just training just to train? Was, what was the mindset going in there? So when, well, I think it was different for different people, but all of us, I think who were there, were there out of some form of a passion, not so much uh, because we were looking to make money. That was nobody's first motivation. Uh, I wanted to see, uh, you know, what I could do in a sport just because I don't know to challenge myself or whatever. Uh, I never, I didn't really care about becoming a champion per se or anything like that. I just, I just thought it would be really cool to, to do it and see what I could do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then Mike, you know, he was always, um, he kind of grew up like being a, a kickboxing fan and watching like the, 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 those movies we all watched back in the day, like, uh, what is it, Kickboxer with Jean-Claude Van Damme and all yeah. this other stuff. <laughs> and, you know, he he went to uh, um, Thailand way back in the day before. Now he has a gym out there, but, I mean, he went there, like, way back in the day when nobody was going there to train uh, Muay Thai, uh, which nowadays all the fighters go and do that. But he, because he was just passionate about the sport and he wanted to learn about it, like, way back in the day. So... Uh, all of us who were there, and I, I don't know, I think we came from like a different beat because we, we, we were there and I think it was, I think it was tougher, uh, because nowadays with, with more money in it, people, um, you know, they're more careful about things and they're more, um, they want about, to get the well, best, the best coach, the best special uh, nutritionist. They yeah, want to get the best promoter and stuff. And they won't do certain things in training because you know you'll get hurt and then you're you're out of uh, a paycheck or whatever. And 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 we would my my toughest fights were in uh, in the gym, no doubt about it. My toughest fights were my sparring <laughs> matches, <Yeah>. sparring uh, <laughs> preparation for a fight. There's no doubt about it. Um, and Part of that was also, so Frank Shamrock was there back in the day when I started. Um, and he, 
and Brian and some of the other guys were early. And AKA was one of the first gyms that was actually like an MMA training gym where yeah. different people from different styles would come and try to put it all together. And Frank was there and he was actually also trying to take people to Japan. Cause again, that's where the money was for the, and you know, not just the money, but the fights. I mean, that's what a sport was. And uh, some of the old attitude which also kind of comes from like this pro wrestling thing of like having to prove your toughness kind of. So they would test you, you know, they would, they would kind of beat you up and see how you handle it kind of thing. Uh, whereas I don't think they do that anymore too much, you know, yeah. uh, <laughs> when you, when you get into, when you want to get into fighting, they don't try to scare you off by beating the hell out of you. <laughs> I've heard, I've heard of some gyms. It. I've heard of some gyms still doing that. No. Yeah, not, not like are the gym that I, I, I train at, uh, I train at a Muay Thai gym called Strike Fitness, uh -huh. and um, it's all Muay Thai sparring. It's not. It's not heavy. I've been to a few gyms where it is like that, but they weren't as talented as the the room in AKA. I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's one. Uh, so what was happening back then is that they would um, take a, a lot of uh, wrestlers, amateur wrestlers, and pull them in because wrestlers um, have have two things going for them. It's first of all, it's really again, it's a very tough sport. So if you're going to make it to the top in wrestling, you're probably going to be a really good athlete and you're probably going to be really tough. And um, also you're, you're having wrestled for any, for a, a considerable amount of time, you're not going to be surprised by anything because you've been <laughs> touched in ways that few others <laughs> have, you know, like it's, it's just not, you just kind of get accustomed to the whole dirtiness of, combat and hand-to-hand -hand combat and all that um and so they would take these wrestlers like josh koscheck who was an excellent wrestler and dc also and all those guys and train them into mixed martial artists uh through you know uh the uh, getting the grappling skills and of course the stand-up skills and the sparring and the experience and um it was a winning formula for a while anyway so yeah and it got them to where they are now and yeah. so so you're in the the you're in aka you're, you're training aka and when who told you are you ready to fight how did that come to be to your first because you didn't i don't think you had any uh, amateur fights right yeah no uh no i didn't uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh well, you know, why fight for free when you can't get paid, right? Yeah. <laughs> I guess I was doing it doing it wrong then. <laughs> <laughs> well, also it was a different time back then, so yeah. uh, uh, some of it was um, there was there weren't as many opportunities to fight, so people would throw money at um, fighters to hit, to put together a show because there there wasn't that many um, opportunities, so uh, they didn't have that many amateur shows. Uh, we'd have, you know, smokers and exhibitions in the gym and whatever, but they didn't have too many, um, actual amateur contests. Uh, plus I had a lot of experience with wrestling and, um, and jujitsu. I did jujitsu and I was pretty natural at that. And they just kind of came to me and asked me if I wanted to do it. And I said, yeah, sure. I want to give it a try. And. I remember sparring with uh, Brian Johnson, who's about six foot four, good, like 250 at the time. Jesus. And <laughs> you're, you're and six, you're about six, two, right? Six, 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 two, six, three. Yeah. Depending okay. on how much I slouch, <laughs> but uh, he was a little bit bigger than me and um, he was all muscle and um, he's a, he's a real athlete too, but um, I kept taking him down because I was relying on my wrestling and then um he got pissed off and just kneed me in the face when I was shooting it on a double and um, lights went out. I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, lose consciousness, but I, I, I couldn't yeah. see, but I was standing up and everybody stopped because it was like a <clears throat> cannon shot or something. And, and then, and then my vision came back and I was like, okay, that's probably the worst shot I'm ever going to have in a fight. So I, I just kind of lost my fear of getting hit, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and that's how I, uh, how I how I got over that um, that fear because you coming from a wrestling background, I was not really used to the um, and I don't know if too many people appreciate the um, uh, the power that you can get out of someone who's trained uh, who's a trained professional 
who intends to maximize the impact of their punch, it's altogether different to get punched by someone who's well-trained to fight versus just somebody out on the street. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's, yeah. It's a completely different experience. I mean, I was, um, I was a bouncer for a, a long time um, uh, at the same time as I was fighting and, and training and everything. And um, I'd never, I had never, uh, I never punched anyone as a bouncer. <laughs> I slapped some people, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I got hit and it was, I, I literally remember like thinking like, Oh my God, this is like a joke. Like, <laughs> like, cause, cause when you've been hit by someone like Paul Blantello, who really knows how to maximize the power of his yeah. punches. And then somebody on the street hits you. It's like a night and day difference. It's like, you got to. And then there's not that many six, (laughs) there's not that many six, two athletes that are walking around ready to punch a security guard too. Right. 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 Yeah. Probably like five, 10 average is anybody that's going to try to hit you. Well, I I also think I have this theory that it's hard to find tough big guys because big guys are used to pushing around smaller people their whole lives and smaller guys are, they get pushed around. They, they have to toughen up. Yeah. <laughs> Big guys, they used to just relying on their size and, and it's even training partners. It's hard to find tough ones. Cause um, is that, is that why there's not that that's a good theory on why there's not that many heavyweights, the, the good, like the heavyweight division. It's, it's, it teeters out a little bit for a few years after there's a, there's a great run of fighters. And then mm-hmm. after you get past the top 10, everybody's not at the elite level. Right. Yeah, uh, I, I think there's a couple of things. I think that's one of them. There's also uh, different sports will draw different types of athletes, like a lot of big guys going to football, going to whatever, um, basketball, whatever. And, and you know, they'll, they might have a better um, chance at making a career or getting a scholarship or whatever out of it. Uh, also, uh, uh, again, the impact with heavyweights is, is, is – it's not just, um, you know, if you're if you're twice the size of someone, uh, the impact is going to be like four times as much. It's not it's not uh, the physics kind of works against you. So, um, I think you probably get uh, more um, injuries. It takes longer to recover. Maybe not more, but when you do get injured, it's probably a bigger injury, and it probably takes longer to recover just because it's a bigger body and like the impact of a punch is bigger. So it, it's it's the uh maybe the risks are higher too for heavyweights yeah. because um plus the weight class is you know from 205 to 265 right it's like a 60 pound yeah. weight class right <laughs> yeah so you get a lot more um um variety i guess in um the other weight classes are a lot closer together in terms of weight and size and everything and she might my have wife, some... go ahead my my wife's been to to fights and she's every been one of your fights to every one of my fights my sister my sister's a fighter too and she's been in sparring rooms she's been to different gyms but she's i don't think she's ever seen a heavyweight fighter a true heavyweight <laughs> fighter it's it's just a different breed like they, they walk in and you're like holy crap and aka has a had a bunch right like it's insane you know it's funny too is um some guys you look at and you think, oh, my God, that's a scary looking specimen. And then you you have some other guys like DC, um, Daniel Cormier, you look at him. That's just some chubby guy. What like, <laughs> you know, like he doesn't, he doesn't look bod. like me. <laughs> huh? What would you say? So that's just some dad bod. <laughs> some dad bod. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, but I love that because, you know, don't judge a book by its cover because he's yeah. an amazing athlete. He ran through the heavyweight division, you know, and then, and then, uh, and then light heavy. I mean, he's, he's one of the most, you know, pound for pound best fighters out there. Um, a- amazing athlete, amazing, um, uh, wrestler. Uh, and you couldn't tell by looking at him, you know, uh, even, even, um, Kane, who's kind of a scare looking guy, but he doesn't look like he doesn't have the big muscles. He doesn't have yeah. the, he's got big hips. He doesn't have big uh, showy muscles or whatever. Um, How man, was it? The... Was a... Oh, sorry. Well, he was uh, a he was a freak. He was a freak in the gym, you know, he was, and, and, and in his fights. How was it the first? Do you remember the first time you, you sparred with them? 
So uh, I do. And well, Velasquez? I don't know if I remember the first time, but I remember sparring with him when he was kind of green, you know, uh, and it was actually easy for me to hit him. And and I did. I hit him hard and he kept coming <laughs> and he always had he always had crazy conditioning. Like he had something with his uh, he has like an abnormally large or whatever efficient heart. I don't know what his deal is, but he's able to keep going. At least he was in those days. He was able to keep going where everybody else got tired. So he would wear me down and I was just like done. And after a while, I couldn't even touch him anymore because he was so good. But when he first came, you know, I could I could catch him. I could uh, catch him uh, on his feet and I could catch him in submissions and whatever. But he's, he's just a different breed because he improved so quickly and he just was – at some point, at one point in his career, I think he was so far above everybody else. Um, and then I think injuries caught up to him and whatnot. But um, yeah, he was a freak. He was a, just a physical freak in terms of being able to just go without stopping. Mm -hmm. And he would work on his technique and he would just pull off things that you don't think that a heavyweight should be able to do. Yeah, that's, that's what. What age were you? What age were you when you start? When you got into it, into fighting? Ah, uh, so let's see. I don't know, like 20, 20, 27 maybe twenty six, twenty five. Oh, you're like in that. your late twenties. Yeah, mid to late twenties. Yeah. So that's I wasn't good to hear because <laughs> I, I, I started when I was twenty eight. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I had a I had a wrestling background to build on. Um, there's also, there's age and then there's like fighter's age, I guess is what they call it. When uh, at some point, you know, fighting just kind of wears on you and it shows and like your, um, it's not a mental thing. It's it, you just, some people develop what they call like the sparring partner syndrome or they, they go out for a fight and it, it, they're used to getting beat up in the gym because they've reached that point and then they just take take a beating in a in a fight and they don't even notice kind of thing like they think they're winning or whatever or <laughs> you know yeah. like you see this in boxing too because a lot of times they'll hire boxers to be sparring partners and then they end up fighting like a sparring partner as opposed to like a fight you know and then there's also the whole thing of like just losing a step and um i don't know i think it happens over time but you don't you don't you don't notice it or you don't um you don't notice it until you notice it <laughs> yeah. so and, yeah. do you 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 were in a, a a good position because you had something to fall back on was there anybody that you i mean you don't have to name them or anything but did you see fighters when they they lost that step was it is it hard for pro fighters to to realize that to, I, I i think it is because i think to be a fighter you have to be kind of um, you have to be a little bit crazy in several ways. Number one, um, at some level, on some level, you have to enjoy getting beat up because every fight or every fighter, I should say, win, lose, or draw at some point, you're going to be beat up. Let's say you win all your fights, but you're, you're going to get hit. You're going to get, <laughs> it's going to hurt. It's things are going to happen, <laughs> you know? Uh, and you have to make peace with that. You don't have to make peace with it. You have to do more than that. You have to be drawn to it. You have to enjoy that. You have to enjoy the battle so much that you enjoy getting beat up. Uh, if you don't, then you don't like to fight. <laughs> <laughs> because in a fight, unless, um, again, you know, there's even, even, even what's his name? Uh, uh, Floyd Mayweather, who made a career out of picking his opponents for himself, you know, uh, uh, and he didn't get hit much, but I mean, he got hit, he got hit too, you know, yeah. and you have to, you have to own that and you have to, um, you have to enjoy that. And that's crazy. <laughs> and then the other thing is you have to believe in yourself in a level that, uh, is also crazy. You have to believe the impossible and, uh, just go in there with an attitude of like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the shit. I'm going to win. I'm going to do whatever. You have to have that crazy confidence, um, or somehow, um, because not every fighter, there there are top level fighters who um, Paul Blantello used to throw up before his fights. Yeah. He used to throw up from be, from having nerves before his fights. 
And when he didn't, uh, that's when we knew he was not going to fight well. <laughs> so he needed that. So different people need different things. He needed to have so much nervous energy that he would little like puke a little bit like yeah. before his fight. And sometimes it was like on the way out to the ring. <laughs> but uh, but that's when he fought well. And some people have different things. But you have to go in there. And once you're fighting, you have to be like just crazy confidence. Go in there. You're going to hit every, you know, hit everything. And you're not going to get hit and whatever. And uh, none of that is rational. But you have to have that belief. So I think some fighters continue to have that belief beyond the time that they should you know they'll they think they still have it and i think a good example of that was uh chuck liddell who i think fought past the time long past the time where he should have retired uh there's others there's also anderson silva i think you know he was one of those all-time greats that i think uh took a few fights too many and uh, uh you know you have uh sakuraba is also one of those guys who was just a phenom and then it was just sad to watch him after a while because they kept throwing him in there and getting beat up and uh, it tarnishes their legacy, you know? So I think a lot of fighters keep going beyond the time that they should. And it's it's kind of hard with fighting the, when I think about it because in football and basketball and all those major league sports, there's always someone behind you to take your spot, right? So when, when a team says, okay, it's time, if you're done, uh, there's this younger guy that's going to take your spot in fighting. There's going to be a promotion that's going to uh, want to sell your name. Right. And you, there's yeah. no one to take your spot. Yeah. And then you have these crazy, uh, you know, it's not, it, it's a different sport. Right. So you have uh, like, you used to have, what's his name? Like one of the early, some of those early pioneers who, who, whose names became, you know, well-known well before the sport even blew up like, um, Dan Severn or somebody like yeah. that, you know, and he would go out in his like late fifties or whatever and fight some Trump, you know, like <laughs> he, uh, fought, uh, he fought Forrest Griffin, I think at an older age in a, a lower promotion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and it's like, uh, you know, the, the people don't go to see those fights because of the sport of it. They go in there because they recognize some name or whatever. And they're like, okay, I want to see this guy. Uh, but you know, they sell tickets the guys are willing to do it so whatever i mean is that is that um is that good for the sport i don't know probably not but i mean whatever it's a free-for-all right so. <laughs> do you, i i know i i want to get to your story but i'm just this is a good conversation I'm, I'm loving it but do you think do you think uh mma can get to a point of being like baseball and football and 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 basketball they did the reebok deal they have they they're they're a lot more professional than before and the people are starting to catch it's it's basically the only fun sport to watch right now during the pandemic right and and, <laughs> <laughs> and so do you think it could get to that point uh well so there um there's always going to be differences there's always differences between those team sports uh because the whole business model and the whole um the way you consume i guess the product or whatever is totally different you know you have these arenas that get filled up and it's uh uh you know cities and whatever have these teams and um and it's just a different business model they have their seasons they have um it's it's a different deal uh mma i think it's it's huge worldwide it's huge in america it's huge um uh, hugely popular in terms of um, uh, viewership and in terms of uh, the money that it's, it generates, I think I think it's already pretty much there. I mean, they're they're making a lot of money. I mean, it's billions of dollars as as an industry. Um, but I don't think it'll ever be uh, like retirement it, for players, or retirement for fighters. So this um, is why it's hard, and that's something that I was trying to do. Um, uh, some time ago, there was a push to put together a union. I was, I was, I was part of that. They had, um, they had us come to the Capitol in California because they were going to model uh, legislation based on the uh, Muhammad Ali Boxing Reform Act and 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 apply it to uh, MMA fighters. And there was a push to put together a union, uh, which I was all for it because uh, I think um, uh, the 
whole notion of bargaining collectively as opposed to individual. You know, the the, the bargaining powers of a promoter of, who's a billion dollar corporation, multi-billion dollar corporation versus a fighter, any fighter, I don't care which fighter, it could be the biggest fighter in the world. Mm. It's always unequal, the bargaining positions. You know, it's not going to be, you're never going to tell the promoter what to do, you know? Um, so those other sports, they have that because they're team sports and because they have their organizations, they're able to, it's more of an equal bargaining position and players are able to, um, you know, press their agendas and their issues and their pay and everything else to, to, to have a more equal um, kind of distribution of the benefits uh, between the owners and the players. Uh, so I don't know if that's ever really going to come together in uh, MMA because it is an individual sport and because everybody is kind of on their own trying to negotiate the sport and negotiate their contracts and doing yeah. whatever. It all uh, comes back to money. Yeah, and ultimately, I mean, that's that's what it is. It's a business. Uh, you know, um, like I said, some of us who started out back in the day, we did it because of the passion of the sport and fighting and everything. But you know, passion is not going to sustain the business. It's going to be the uh, it's going to be the people who are willing to spend money on it, who generate the revenue. And and right now, I think that even though fighters get more money. You know, the power, all the power in the sport is with the promoters, uh, especially the UFC. They're the biggest promotion. So did you did you because you're a lawyer, did you ever want to get into managing for, for fighters? Um, I thought about it, but um, I, I I have other things going on. I'm a I'm a judge advocate in the army right now, so it's not something that I can do. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe down the line, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so let's. Get, I want to get into that. So you're you work for the army, and after you transition from from UFC, it's incredible. Your life is incredible, right? You you came. <laughs> it's just, I I'm I'm really big on the learning process right now, like mm -hmm. how people learn because at a young age, going through public school, no one no one taught me how to learn. They just said, here, do this, do this, do this, do this. And it's not, it's not after hearing you say that you, you learned all these languages at a young age, it's not only did you learn languages, but you learned how to learn things. And I think that's super important when it comes to growing up and, and getting into adulthood. And it, it it's, it's, you had a, a really cool life. And do you think that that, that uh that helped you just kept you you kept on learning new things how big was that impact for you well it's funny you should uh put it that way because that's that's something that never um uh, that never ends i always that's a need that i feel that i have is that's that's one of the things that motivates me right i always want to try new things and learn new things and do different things um i have that kind of a hunger inside me like a lot of you know a lot of fighters uh, will say that they have that hunger to be the best or whatever. And that's good for the sport of fighting. I've always had like a hunger to just learn new things and do different things, which is probably why um, I ended up doing a bunch of, uh, you know, I'm not, I, I was never, um, I'm not a household name in MME. I never was. Uh, and, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm kind of like a jack of all trades, but master of none kind of thing. Uh, which doesn't bother me at all. I, I, I think it's, I think I've been very fortunate to have um, had the opportunities to be involved in those uh, uh, sort of areas that are vastly different or some people would say are incompatible or whatever, but I, I kind of see some common themes between my fighting career and between my uh, legal career, because uh, from some perspective, uh, you know, they both involve uh, a contest, like we have an adversarial system in, in the in, in the court, in the courtroom. Um, so it's a contest of two sides with a set of rules. And within those set of rules, you can do whatever you, as long as you abide by the rules to try to win. And that's what MMA is. You know, it's a contest between two more or less equal uh, competitors with a set of rules trying to win. 
And so the mindset to me is very similar for uh, preparing for uh, a courtroom battle, a trial, or preparing for a contest in MMA. <laughs> but I want to touch upon something else that you said, which is talking about education. Um, because I also had a chance to, um, I, I have a master's in philosophy and for a little while I taught some classes at San Jose State in uh, philosophy. And uh, I took a different approach to, uh, to teaching. Um, I taught uh, moral issues and ethics and stuff like that. And uh, <clears throat> I think that there's, there's a, a lack of, like you said, people would, throughout your education, I guess in your experience, people would kind of like, throw things at you and kind of expect you to learn or whatever. And that's not how I, is that fair to say? That's what I got from what you said. I don't want to yeah, put yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it is. It's exactly how I felt. <laughs> and, and, and to me, that misses the point, right? Uh, Cause I think education is supposed to kind of um, induce a change from within the person. So you kind of draw things out as opposed to throw things at people. So what I would try to do in my class is, uh, to kind of uh, get the kids involved in more critical thinking, we would uh, basically, I would give them some tools in the first part of the class, which is explain, uh, you know, four or five different ethical theories so they could have a language to talk about what we talked about. And then the next part of the class was they would choose whatever topic they wanted to debate that was an ethical issue or a moral issue, such as um, uh, capital punishment or euthanasia or like abortion or anything else. And they would debate against each other. And so the, the idea is that uh, as opposed to uh, some, uh, you know, learned teacher or whatever, like uh, throwing information at them, they'll come up with their own stuff and do their own debates. And, and, and in that way, they'll uh, use their critical thinking skills and uh, kind of uh, learn to, uh, uh, I guess critical thinking is the best way to put it, but it's... Um, it's not something that is uh, just given to you like like a book thrown at you, like here, learn this. It's something that you do through practice. It's something well, that you do. You're, you're saying, I, I don't know if it's called, it's probably called something else, but you're, you're, you're teaching the martial art format you, you, to fighter, to fighter, right? So you go into the gym, you learn all these, the, you learn all these techniques, and then you go into the critical thinking, which is getting into the cage and seeing what happens. And then you learn from that and then go back to the, to the square one of learning technique and then going back to the cage and, and learning how to fight, basically. That's, yeah, that's, see, I didn't even think of that until you said that. But yeah, that's, that's basically true. You, you get the tools and it's up to you to put that together, right? And, and you, have to, you have to be creative about it and you have to figure out what works for you. That's the other thing about, um, it's funny you bring that back to fighting. And the same thing in wrestling, fighting or whatever, like every body is different and different things are going to work for you than for somebody else left. You can get guidelines. I'm, I'm not uh, one of these guys like in, um, uh, let's say jujitsu or whatever, they'll explain a technique and they'll do it one way and they'll make everybody do it that same way. I don't believe that that's the right way. You know, there yeah. are guidelines, uh, but there's always exceptions to the rules. There's always different ways of doing things. You know, I would, that's where I made my money. I, I found different ways to do things. And that's where I, um, uh, and by made my money, I mean, that's where I would catch people with submissions because that's where I would do stuff because I would find different ways to do, uh, like like in jiu-jitsu, one of the like rules, cardinal sins, is like you don't give up your back, right? Yeah. I would give up my back all the time. Uh, and which means I got used to it. I wasn't panicked when I gave up my back and I would submit people when they were on my back. I would get leg locks. I would get all kinds of okay. stuff. Yeah. You know? <clears throat> and you know they get all excited because they're taking my back and all of a sudden i have them <laughs> in a heel hook or whatever right <laughs> so um so anyway i don't know I'm, I'm, maybe i'm veering off topic but yeah that's, no that's you're just you're just talking about the learning process and that's what because at 28 is where really when i really dived in she was she, she thought i was crazy but i really dived into martial arts and and i feel like because I didn't really have a proper, I didn't go to college. I, I kind of just, uh, I got kicked out at 18 and I was just sent off to fend on my own. And I just found jobs. I was just finding jobs. And eventually I found FedEx 
And FedEx, it's kind of like mundane. You get there, you do it, you go home, you sleep, you get up and do it over and over. So you're, you're not working your brain. All of a sudden, 20, I turn 28, I start learning martial arts, I want to fight, and my brain starts working. And ever since I started martial arts, I just want to learn new things. I learned how to do this podcast, the audio. Um, right now, I'm diving into chess. You know what I mean? I'm really, <laughs> I suck at I suck at it right now, but I'm, I'm trying, right? <laughs> like, it's, it, it, I feel like, and I'm coaching in Muay Thai right now, too. And I, I coach the kids. And it's, it's an awesome thing because you, you kind of, there's something that has to change in, in education, right? And in, in public school. It's just, I think you just don't have enough teachers that care, to be honest. I, I think that's part of it. I think the system itself is probably not set up the right way. It, 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 it's more, not just, not just um, like K through 12. It's also like in college. I don't think it's set up the right way. Like one of the, one of the things that like, for example, the ancient um, Greek way of looking at learning was to uh, find a, somebody to emulate to find someone who's already wise who's already good at whatever you look at how they do it and you try to be like them right. and that takes time it's like an apprenticeship it's it's not something where you go through a class you check that block you go through a class you check another block and you and that way you get a degree eventually because you checked all the blocks that wouldn't do it you would have to uh learn through experience and emulation and, and that, that's kind of how martial arts is actually because usually you, you learn from you know whatever like black belt whatever whoever it, whoever it is they kind of take you under their wing and they you you learn their style or whatever it is by emulating them but but making it your own right like i was saying like everybody's different you have to you have to do things differently uh that work for your body it may not work for somebody else's body or or somehow it works for you but you learn by watching and emulating others and making it your own kind of thing. And again, that's that's something that is based on practice and it takes time. So just by reading how to do a push kick or whatever, right? You're not gonna learn how to do a push kick. Yeah. You have to do it and you have to figure it out and you have to make it work for yourself and you have to do it in different situations and you have to see if you can do it when somebody's charging you or whatever, blah, blah, blah. You, that's how you learn it, right? It's not by, and our education is more like, here's a push kick. Okay, now you know how to do bush cake, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm drawing an analogy here, but it's it's kind of like that's that's what it seems like to me. It's transactional. It's like you go to this class, you check it off. That means you did it. You're certified. Well, no, that's not you have to works. have the experience to you have to pay your dues, kind of to earn the right to say that you know something because you you experience you learn it through experience. That's real learning, I think. You know. And that's what and that's great. It seems like you you were really inspired by martial arts and kind of like it sounds like it kind of changed your life in that like you look you look at the world differently now, right? Big time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like a whole different person. I, I look at myself <laughs> two, three years ago. I'm like, who was that guy? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't think I'm gonna be the greatest fighter ever. You know, I don't that's not on my my mind. It, um, for me, it's more about my sister. My sister is all in. She's 25 right now. She's a, a a Muay Thai fighter. She's only had one amateur, but it was on three days notice against a, uh, it was for a title on three days notice for an amateur title. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy. And <laughs> and uh, me, it's more of like, okay, I, I put my foot in the door first, right? And and now she's going to do it. And and now my some of my fr best friends are are martial artists. It's like I'm the first one in. My job is to to figure this thing out, and then when they do it, uh, I guess have experience so, to tell them, and they they send it off to other people that that go <clears throat> after them. So that that's what I'm trying to do, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> she, she 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 just thinks I'm crazy. No, well, so I I I know. Uh, we're at, we're all I, I could talk to you forever yeah Christian, you can't you can talk but forever. i have one more question <laughs> i have sure. one more question yeah, i have one more question for you yeah um shane carwin you mm -hmm. uh you fought that you guys it was known as the i guess the smartest man uh <laughs> it was the, the lawyer and the engineer or something like that <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it, but you were an engineer too right before you went to law school um, well, I was a, I was a network engineer. I, I worked in the high tech field for, for a while. 
Um, so I was like a Cisco certified network professional. Uh, and I worked for um, a uh, uh, nationwide uh, um, uh, broadband provider. Um, and so I got a bunch of like uh, tech certifications. I don't have a, a, a degree in it. I don't have a college degree in it. I just, uh, um, you know, got some tech certifications to kind of like self-study basically. From Cisco, I was a CISSP, which is not Cisco. That's a information system certified security professional or something like that. And then some other ones. But yeah, I, I what I, didn't I did you that. do, man? What what didn't you do? <laughs> <laughs> but um, so the way how, I like to say it is, I I failed at so many things, I racked up a lot of experience, you know. <laughs> that's exactly it. Like, that's my quarantine <laughs> right now. <laughs> <laughs> but so, can you just real quick just take us through that? How was that experience going through, uh, going to fight Shane Carwin? He's another guy that's just he's I guess you would call it a kinetic learner. Both of you guys, you guys do a bunch of of stuff right and uh you guys learn hands-on basically and you guys are both smart and how was that going up to that fight um so i uh, uh different fighters have different kind of ways like i said of preparing and whatever but i was always very uh reliant on my coaches and they'll tell you this because i always listen real well my, my confidence came from trusting in my coaches so i would kind of like as opposed to me being like ego driven like i know best i would i would trust i would get my confidence by trusting my coaches and so um a lot of times i would um before fights i would uh talk with my coaches and say okay i would ask him things like that other fighters probably don't ask like i, was, I would ask him flat out like because they were always honest with me i would ask him hey can i win this fight and they would be like yes <laughs> Um, and then they would tell me how. And so with um, Carwin, he had never gone past like the first or second round or whatever. So the idea was to to get there, which I didn't. But here's a couple of um, a couple of uh, uh, things about that. Uh, and I don't looking back on it, you know, whatever. Uh, but at the time, uh, my uh, my mouthpiece that I was using, I lost it somewhere. So we bought like a mouthpiece the night before or something and it didn't fit right. So if you watch the fight, you kind of see me kind of chewing on it or whatever. And um, I thought uh, he got he got me real good with that punch, but I was not out. But my mouthpiece went flying because for one thing, it didn't it didn't fit right. And you know, I went down and then uh, and then I covered up uh, and the ref stopped the fight and I was like, oh crap, he stopped the fight. Um, but that same card, I think it was the same card where it was like Keith Jardine or somebody, uh, took like nine or 12 unanswered shots. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, I get it. You know, it looked pretty bad. I took a big shot, but I wasn't, or you could have been that guy or you could have been that guy that was, I could have been that guy. And the thing is they, they don't have a, they didn't have an even, uh, uh, you know, if they're going to let that go, why didn't they let mine go just a little bit longer? Cause yeah. I wasn't out. Like I, I get it. My knees buckled. I was, it looked pretty bad. Uh, in retrospect, I don't have too much like <clears throat> water under bridge, right? Who cares? But, um, yeah, he was a, he was a big, strong guy and he took his, uh, shot and he nailed it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, I think, the longer the fight would have gone, the more it would have been in my favor uh, yeah. because uh, I I was able to, you know, uh, endure or my endurance was pretty good. And I was able to uh, go uh, keep going, you know, round after round. Uh, so I think I think I would have had that uh, to my advantage. But unfortunately, it didn't. Uh, it didn't go. That I, didn't, way. I didn't want to make you go through the fight. I was just asked. Sorry about that. I just <laughs> wanted to ask you, like. How was it going? Because you don't go against guys that are as uh, I, I guess have the degrees, and there's not that many people. There's when the UFC, there's all in fighters, right? So it's rare to see two guys of that that caliber in college and all that stuff. It's it's just kind of cool, right? I, I guess that's what I was trying to get. Yeah, at. honestly, I didn't think much about that because you're just you're just trying to get through the fight. Um, I do think that in um, MMA, because a lot of people come come up through um, 
wrestling and various other sports that kind of put them in college. Because the only way that you're going to keep wrestling uh, beyond high school is if you go to college and wrestle. Yeah. So a lot of guys do have that college experience. Uh, honestly, that's the reason why I went to college. Uh, I, I didn't, I'm the first one in my family to graduate from college. And um, my parents kind of told me that like, they can't pay for school. So I'm on my own. And I, I, I got into school because of wrestling. And then I, I dropped out because of because I got hurt. I had no interest in school. I dropped out. I eventually finished. I went back and finished, but my initial motivation was wrestling. So I think the same way uh, wrestlers oftentimes will end up in college because of wrestling. And then they might end up in MMA because they want to keep fighting or make money or whatever. Uh, so in that regard, there's probably more, I mean, it's the same thing with, um, uh, football and basketball, I guess, except those guys, when they make it to the pros, they, you know, they usually drop out before they <laughs> graduate, right? Yeah. Um, whereas a lot of times wrestlers and other uh, athletes like that who don't really have that chance, you know, there's no like pro wrestling as far as amateur wrestling goes. There's pro wrestling, like big time wrestling, but that's not, yeah. that's more of an exhibition. It's not really a sport. Not to, Again, I was a I'm I'm a fan of pro wrestling, so I'm not taking anything away from the performance that it is, but it's not a real sport. Uh, it's it's very tough. It's very physically demanding. Uh, it's just not a real competition. It's entertainment. Yeah, yeah. good point. <laughs> which and which, well, nowadays there's some crazy athleticism in pro wrestling. You see those guys do just amazing things. Uh, so I mean, I respect uh, pro wrestling. It's not I'm not gonna talk trash about them. It's just you know not a sport. Yeah, no one's no one's saying it's not easy. I, I feel I, like the people fight on it a bunch, and, and people are saying it's not a sport. They're not saying it's not easy. It's, it's still hard. I can't go out there and do it, right? But Christian, I we didn't talk about your story at all, which is okay. <laughs> which is okay. Which is okay. I I love this conversation, and I just it, you think the same way I I do, but you're just more uh, successful than I am. <laughs> so. I, well, I, don't, say, I don't have a podcast yet, but I'm going to start that. <laughs> you inspired yeah, me. <laughs> yeah. And you were on Mike Swick's podcast too, right? Yeah. 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 He has, a, he actually has a really good podcast. I like it. Yeah. He's uh, out in uh, Thailand. Yeah. I visited him out there a couple of times. He's a, uh, he's a good guy. He's got a great place out there. Uh, AKA Thailand. Um, <clears throat> I was there when he was first building it and everybody thought he was crazy. He's one of those guys who um, uh, he had a he had like a, a picture a long time ago his mom gave him or something like that. I forget where it was from, but he has a quote on it from somebody. It says, um, uh, "I want to get it right, so I, <laughs> I want to make sure I don't screw it up." But it says something about um, there are there are those who think they can, and there are those who think they cannot, and they're both right. Something like that. So like. If you think you can, you're going to be able to do it. If you don't believe in yourself, you're not going to do it. He was always uh, the guy who would uh, believe in himself and just go for it, you know. And so he had this notion about building a gym out, an MMA gym in Thailand, which had never been done before because they're very, you know, Muay Thai is their national sport and they're protected over it and everything. And he pulled it off. He was the first one to do it. And so, yeah, he'd be, he's a, he's a, he's a great guy. Very, uh, he always, I always held him in high regard because of that, um, how much faith he had in himself and how much he applied himself to do things. He's also a guy who never went to college. He just pursued his own thing and uh, that's freaking uh, awesome. Succeeded at it, you know. That's awesome. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know that. that that's I'm. That's freaking awesome. I'm amazed by it. By the way, <laughs> um, but I like to. I sometimes I do forget when I talk to guests, but I like to end it with with them telling uh, giving advice to anybody going after their dreams or their passions or or just taking the 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 least road taken uh do you have anybody advice for future lawyers future fighters anybody just going after their passion um so i i, I came from it from i came at things at everything pretty much from a kind of a different perspective like i i said before like with fighting my my goal wasn't i i would say don't set a goal that others think you should set like don't if you're gonna get into fighting fighting don't don't you know people say well are you gonna 
I don't, let's say people might ask you, are you going to fight in UFC? Are you going to be this? Are you going to do that? Are you going to do, don't worry about all that. Do it for your own reasons. You know, uh, for some people, it's just to have one fight to see what it's like. For some people, it's, you know, to see how far they can take it. I mean, that, that was with me, you know, and, and don't let others dictate your goals for you. Right. And don't let others dictate your motivations for you. And I think, and be honest with yourself, you know, uh, for me, most of the time, um, I'm not one of those guys who comes from this, um, super like, uh, overconfident kind of background where I think I can do anything. It's just, I just want to try. <laughs> I, just want to see, I just want to see if I can do it. You know, maybe I can yeah. prove myself wrong. Like maybe I have that in the back of my head that says, oh, you can't do this. Well, let me see. Let me see if I can, you know? <laughs> yeah. And 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 that's that's all it was for me with everything. You know, uh, I honestly, I probably didn't believe I could finish law school or whatever, but I said, hey, I'm going to give it a shot. And um, And I did. And some things work out and some things don't. And that's okay. Um, I'm okay with my, um, you know, my fighting career. I'm pretty happy with, uh, however that turned out. I got to, uh, I got to fight in a bunch of, uh, pay-per-views in front of, uh, tens of thousands of people in, uh, Las Vegas and, uh, Japan and all this other stuff. Uh, meanwhile, I got to finish law school. Sometimes I went to class with a black eye, but, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, I should share this, or uh, maybe I shouldn't, but I will anyway. It's it's kind of a funny <laughs> story. So in law school, while I was fighting, um, I, that that's exactly what happened. I, I got a nice shiner and a black eye and everything, and I went to um, uh, went to the office to do some um, administrative thing, uh, whatever it was. And the the girl who worked there, this lady who worked there, she was pretty and everything. She's like, "Hey, um, nice fight." But, you know, like sometimes when you're in a certain place, you don't expect to hear certain things. So it didn't even register like what what she was saying. Turns out she's one of the ring girls and she, oh. <laughs> and she was she was working at our um, in the, um, you know, whatever administrative office of, of the law school. But she was also like a ring girl that would do that part time. So, <laughs> you know, you never know, yeah. you never know when you run across uh, people from different segments of your life. Uh, That's but crazy. anyways, yeah, it's That's crazy. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you again, Christian. Hopefully one day me and my wife have a huge studio and you're someone I could have on like 24 times in a year. But, um, <laughs> but it, where can people find you? Uh, pff, Any, nowhere. If you have social media. Yeah. That's good. That's awesome. I, I got another story about that. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I, uh, so I was overseas uh, with, with the military and uh, my um, uh, wallet was actually stolen. I was on a train uh, on leave and I fell asleep and my wallet was stolen. And uh, so I reported my cards, you know, shut them down, whatever. So um, I so I wouldn't lose any any more money than the cash that I had in the wallet and all that. And then a little while later, maybe a month later or something like that, I got, I got this email from someone that I served with in uh, Korea uh, in a different part of the world and saying, Hey, it was nice chatting with you on Facebook. I said, Hey, I'm not on Facebook. What are you talking about? <laughs> and come to find out somebody had set up a fake uh, Facebook uh, page with all of my information, my pictures, everything. And so my friend who sent me the email reached out to that thinking it was me, had a conversation on Facebook, just a short one. And uh, whoever it was, the imposter, uh, knew enough about me to fool my friend that it was me. It wasn't me. <laughs> so I got on <laughs> Facebook because I, I had a Facebook account pre previous prior to that. And I, but I'd sign off. So like when you sign back on it, it pulls it back up. Right. So it, it never goes away, I guess, Facebook, or maybe there's a way to make it go away. I don't know, but uh, you can sign back on and then it comes back up. So I signed back on and I reported the fake account saying, Hey, this is an imposter account. And so Facebook comes back and says, okay, well, you have to prove your identity uh, <laughs> with like an official ID. Yeah. And I said, Oh, my, my wallet was stolen. The only thing I have <laughs> is the passport 
So they kicked me off Facebook and they kept the fake account on there <laughs> because they thought <laughs> I was the imposter. <laughs> so, Is the account still up or did they take it down now? Well, so here's what happened. So I, I, I came back stateside after serving overseas and then I got a, 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 my, uh, a renewed driver's license and I uploaded that to Facebook and they finally got rid of the uh, imposter account. And so now I have like a, an account that it's not on my name, but I, I never check it. The only thing I do is every now and then, uh, every couple of months, I log on to see if there's a fake account out there with my name on it. Because uh, <laughs> it's crazy. It, it's crazy yeah. the things that happen, you know? So yeah, I think somebody... it's better that you, you don't you don't have social media. Yeah, it, it's the most successful or smart people are not on social me media, by the way. Yeah, I used to be and then I didn't know what it was for. So I got off it. <laughs> <laughs> so go, go, go find a uh, uh, Christian uh, Wellish at Wikipedia. Anything that's not social media. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think I think I might I think I might. Uh, you know, I'm going to do it. I'm going to have to go back on. Uh, you should I used just to... create your own, fa uh, like a fan page for yourself. Your own <laughs> fan page. It's going to be just me and Chris Delgado. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And thank you, Chris Delgado, for, for linking us up, by the way, man. I, I, I appreciated this interview. I appreciated this conversation. And uh, I I hope you, you, you find a lot more uh, podcasts to be on. And I hope this podcast shares your story as well, too. I mean, as big mm. as well, too. So, yeah, thanks. You got to give me some tips because I'm going to start podcasting. You yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, you should, man. There's, I, 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 you probably do have connections to old, older fighters, too, or even fighters in general. So, I mean, or whatever you want to talk, whatever about. You talk <laughs> whatever about. Whatever you want to talk about. <laughs> but yeah, that'd be awesome, man. I, I think it'd be good. So I just thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys for, for uh, tuning into the Hassle of Hair. See you guys next time.